I think we can get started. Okay, well, good evening. My name is Karen Gallagher. I work here at the Circulation Department, and I have the honor of, of meeting Mr. Donahue, who's a big part of the library, big supporter of the library, the town in general, and tonight he's going to give you uh, a rundown on his days in the Peace Corps. So enjoy the event. Thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. I'm going to start off sitting down and as my energy gets going, I'm picking up. Uh, just a couple of introductory facts about the Peace Corps. This is uh, your 64th anniversary. Uh, there's been uh, uh, 250,000 people have served in the Peace Corps since it began. Uh, 300 have died in service. Uh, they served 142 countries. Today, it's 61 countries. 65% uh, are women, 45% men. Average age is 26. And about 3% uh, uh, are over, over 60. And I had, in the village I was in, I had a lady 67 years old, and Jimmy Carter's mother served in India at 67. So I'm going to go through a variety of different topics and hopefully have some questions later if you'd like. Uh, I'm starting off with just uh, the topic everybody had an interest in is how did you become interested in the Peace Corps itself? Uh, uh, I think I grew up as a kid in Norwood with my father, and I used to hear all of his stories about World War II, and he served five years in the Navy. Uh, uh, it was torpedoed twice in eight battles, and I always, as a young kid, thought about service, you know, <laughs> the greatest generation, what they did. So it always in the back of my mind, you know, it would be nice to serve like them. Uh, he. Uh, gave me a lot of great stories. And so suddenly in 1960, Kennedy was running for president. And he was in a campaign stop in Michigan, University of Michigan, and they said, it's like late at night, and he said, do you think we should still go there? And they said, we ought to go out short. At 2 o'clock in the morning, he showed up at the University of Michigan. And there were 10,000 students cheering him. And during that talk, he said, how many of you would be willing to give up two years of your life to do something for the United States, serve in a developing country. And the students really were supportive. How many of you could work in healthcare, education, uh, teaching, uh, various services, and so on? That laid the groundwork that once he got elected, they said, don't remember, remember what you did. So they, he set up the Peace Corps, 1961. Uh, at that time, uh, I'm in college, I'm about to graduate. And I was accepted to go to the BU Law School. I was on a waiting list to go to the medical school, and I had applied for the Peace Corps. So I asked my father about it, and he was very upset. About, he wanted me to go to law school and practice with him. I said, well, Dad, you know, I can go to law school when I get out. Would you object if I looked at it when I get out? So I got my father to support my going in. Uh, the uh, one of the things I had to do, I had to go to the draft board and get permission to leave the United States. I would be employed by the Department of State, but you needed permission. So the draft board thought I was crazy. They said, you're giving up a three-year deferment to go to Vietnam. We can draft you. And I said, well, if you have to draft me, but can't you wait till I get out of the Peace Corps? But you didn't get out of the, the draft just by going to the Peace Corps. But the person at the draft board said, I'm going to tell them that you had the chance. You had a three-year deferment. Maybe we'll postpone. Uh, accepting you. I also read in the newspaper there was a, a, a sultan from Malaysia in a hospital in Boston. And I was just a young kid. I was just, why don't I go in and welcome him to Boston? <laughs> a little crazy. So I go into the hospital and there's this gentleman in a bed, very quiet. And there's another one sitting there. And I, he said, well, who are you? And I said, well, I just wanted to welcome the sultan. To, well, I'm about to go to Malaysia. So he kind of looked at me as a, you know, a little lunatic. So. So we sat down and talked, and I said, I'm about to go to Malaysia, you know, and I'm going to work in tuberculosis control. So he said, okay. Uh, so we had a nice chat, and they gave me his business guide. He said, when you get to Malaysia, if you'd like, look me up. He said, I'm a physician, but I'm also the governor of one of the states in Malaysia. I'd love to meet you over there and talk to you. So later in the story, there's some wonderful opportunities to meet with him. Uh, I'm at Logan Airport, about to leave, and... Uh, my, uh, I suddenly realized that I'm about to go to uh, Hawaii to be trained and then to 
my leisure that's on the, the equator, so I take off my winter coat and give it to my mother who broke into tears. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was the toughest part of leaving, giving her the coat. So the next thing I'm in Hawaii. Arrive in Honolulu, fly 200 miles down to the island of Hawaii, to Hilo, Hawaii, to spend the Peace Corps training. So there are 40 of us going to go on this program to go to Malaysia to work with tuberculosis control. Uh, they had to train us in 12 weeks to be able to go over there and survive, because some of us would be by ourselves. We weren't going to be uh, necessarily with people who spoke English. So we uh, they divided us up into groups of 10 people. And we, we worked with those 10 people most of the time. Sometimes the group of 40 got together. Uh, most of us are young kids. We had one gentleman with us who was 45 years old. Uh, he, uh, Otis Montgomery, uh, he was a black uh, uh, early volunteer to Second World War. He was in a tank in Second World War. Served in Vietnam, served in Korea. You know, we heard President Kennedy talk about peace he said, I thought I'd give it a shot. So he was a unique member of our group. The big issue was to teach us how to speak the language, Malay, because when you're on your own, no one's speaking English. So it was five hours a day of learning how to speak it. No reading, just speaking it. Apakaba, apakaba. We would say that 50 times. The language instructors would laugh because some of us had a Boston accent, some of us had a Texas accent, so they're kind of laughing at uh, variations, but anyway, that was the most intensive part of the training, learning the language. After the classes, we continued to speak it. The language instructors who were educated from Malaysia would speak it with us, so that was a big thing to learn. Big thing was how do you talk to people, how do you bargain for food, how do you get directions, how do you order food, how do you talk to TB patients, how are you today? Just basic survival language. They also taught us, again, about uh, the, uh, the culture, what's Islam, wh wh why is it different? What can you expect? How did Malaysia become independent? The whole history of Malaysia, things like that. And then uh, there was a lot of things like, uh, uh, they had small groups, they called it sensitivity training. They wanted to teach you how to not offend other people in another culture. If I sat in, a, in Malaysia crossing my, my legs with my my bottom of my foot facing you, it would be disgusting. Uh, there's a book called The Silent Language, which teaches if you're in South America and a man comes up to you and talks to you close and you back away, that's insulting. So there's subtle little things. So if you go into with a group of people and you don't know who they are at a party or an event, you know, you look for clues. You know, do you shake hands? Do you kiss? Do you hug? How far apart? Do, do men touch women? Little subtle things to be able to exist in a different culture. And it would be different for the Muslims than the Hindus or the Buddhists. So that, that was an attempt to educate us on how to look for differences like that. The, uh, we then would every Friday or Saturday get vaccinations. When, you know, we get nine vaccinations today for kids going to school. But we're not being vaccinated for infectious hepatitis or for diseases in Asia. Mosquito-borne disease, malaria, and dengue fever. So they try to give us vaccinations. And after the vaccine, you'd have a fever for about 24 hours. But that was every week to try to prepare us because they didn't know where you were going to be and you weren't going to have the usual background of public health and things that we had in the United States. We went to a village, Waipio Valley. It's a deep valley outside of Hilo. <coughs> I went down into the valley. At the top of the valley was a jeep, and they said, if you hear this siren, and they played the siren, run for the walls. So what, what, there was a tsunami here not too long ago. An earthquake in the Pacific it can be an hour away. To, if that, a lot of people died on the, the Hilo part of uh, Hawaii, uh, and that's the only danger of being down at sea level. So we lived for a, a week in, in houses like they'd live in a village. You used the, the river for going to the bathroom and for bathing. At night, you gave you bargain for food to get eat. One night, they gave us a chicken. And I said, what's this? This is supper. <laughs> I was not a farmer. I didn't know how to prepare a chicken, a live chicken. So by the end of that week, they were trying to let us see. 
hey, you really want to go live like this maybe for two years? So a lot of, they're trying to encourage you to leave rather than get overseas and decide, you know, what am I doing here? It's crazy. So that week in this valley was an attempt to give you that kind of feedback. We talked Malay all the time. Uh, and uh, for free time while we're there, the side of the island we're on got 170 inches of rain a year. The same island had five inches of rain. The middle of the island had a mountain, Mauna Kea, 13,800 feet. The storms would come and hit the mountain and dropped all the rain. So we tried to get out of there if we could on weekends. So you'd go out and you'd hitchhike. And so the local people, when they saw young white people, would pick you up to talk to their kids. You know, they were, this is a guy from Texas, this guy from Cal So it was a wonderful chance for the, the local Hawaiians to meet us. Uh, we were there during Christmas, and you know, you're away from your family, it's Christmas, so we're studying language one night. And it, the training place was in an old tuberculosis hospital, and there's long hallways, and all of a sudden we hear Christmas carols. The little local kids come in to make us feel at home, singing Christmas carols. It was a very touching moment being away from your family. We, the most active volcano, one of the most, is on this island. And it actually goes up every year. And they have places where you can walk down across a one mile walk across crunching. So I, I'm walking across this to the active part of the volcano. There's volcanoes with, and I go, what is under here? And they go, well, about 30 miles down is the active churning of the vault, you know, the, all of the, uh, uh, the stuff that's going to come. And it blows up every year on this other part. So it was, a, a, and then they have beaches called black sand beaches, which is the, the lava come down, the ocean pounds, it, it turns black. So it's just an incredibly unique place to, to see. So we spent our time just getting out, getting around. Uh, finally, what I didn't fully realize is that while we're over there, the FBI is doing background checks on us. You know, could we be a problem? Could we ever be a problem to the State Department? And when I was in college, we, I worked as a waiter on Cape Cod every summer. And this one year, we, we got together about 20 of us after work. We were legally able to drink beer. We're drinking beer, the record player is broken, and 10 police come in and arrest us for breaking the Falmouth anti-noise law, which was, they wanted a newspaper article to keep get kids from Boston to go to Hyannis, so. But I had to say, I was arrested. I was never you know, convicted. So the FBI goes to Norwood, to the home of one of my friends. At 7.30 in the morning, his mother, and he says, I'm with the FBI. There's Ken Abbott's and live here. So the mother just put her, has a heart attack. So he lives out back in a, in a apartment. So he goes out to see my friend. He says, I'm with the FBI, can I, so come on in, he has a cup of coffee, he says, I'm investigating Mr. Donahue to you know, go into the Peace Corps, so. He said, do you know anything about this arrest? So my friend says, yeah, I'm a school teacher, I'm a hockey coach, and I get arrested too, a whole bunch of us did. Did you ever, did you happen to know FBI agent Frizzoli? And he says, yeah, he's my boss. He said, well, ask him about it, his two sons got arrested too. So anyway, it was, so anyway, they are, doing that kind of thing, do we want to send these kids overseas? You know, in fairness to them, we had one girl leave the Peace Corps, she didn't, she just didn't like what was going on. And, uh, and then they say, well, look under your door, seven o'clock in the morning, and there's an envelope there that says, you know, pack your bags up and come down to the office, we're sending you home. You're not gonna go into the Peace Corps. Or it says, pack your bags and come down, we're gonna send you over to Honolulu for a week, rest and recreation before we send you overseas. So we stayed at a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a downtown Honolulu, not a fancy place, YMCA uh, uh, place to street before they ship us out. So the next day, we're on a plane going to Malaysia. A short stop in uh, Hong Kong. I said, gee, I'd love to come back here sometime. This is a fascinating place. So we arrived in Kuala, Tringa, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, the capital. Anyway, we meet with the director of the TB Center, he runs the program, and he had met an American doctor five years before and asked him how, how are they trying to get rid of tuberculosis? And he said, well, the British did a lot when they were here, when, before we came independent, and then they left. 
So we were left with a lot of ideas, but we didn't have a lot of infrastructure of people. So this doctor says, well, what if I sent over to you some college kids to help? So this guy says, well, would they really want to come? You know, so finally, they made an agreement that 40 of us would go over to work in the tuberculosis control program that they had already established to try to come in and beef it up from <coughs> what was left when the uh, people left. So we spent two weeks being trained at the, the, the tuberculosis center. The nurses' quarters where uh, all the girls in our group stayed, we stayed in the housing. They had like a, th a four-story uh, block house that we were had a chance to see. And he basically had given us feedback on what to expect when we get there. Then they said, where would you like to go? And I had, no one had any clue where they would want to go. Some people said, I'd like to be in a big city or I'd want to be near Singapore. And I naively just said, I'd like to be near the beach. The ocean, I, can, I don't want to be in the jungle. Just get me near a beach. So they sent me over to Kuala Tranganu, which was the east coast of Malaysia. And just to give you a little bit of flavor of what we're talking about here, this area is called Southeast Asia. The major countries in Southeast Asia uh, is Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. That's, those are the major areas, and I'll talk about that later. Excuse me, sorry, Connor. Anyway, that's, uh, so uh, what I didn't fully uh, appreciate at the time was the, uh, uh, because it was very rural and isolated, it's when you get educated in Malaysia to become a doctor or a nurse or an engineer, you don't want to go over there. This, there's no TV, barely radio, no newspapers, it's, you know, uh, it's Siberia to, so, all I want to be though it's near the ocean. So anyway, I enjoyed it in, in, in very, very much because of that. So suddenly, you know, we're uh, on a plane going to Kuala Tranganu and I arrive at the airport and there's a, a Chinese gentleman named Mr. Kui who is the physician's assistant that ran the local TB clinic. And I was really to be supporting him. I didn't have any authority. I didn't want authority. We were supposed to be there to help and leave and not, you know, leave, well, they didn't need us to be there. Uh, three nurses in our Land Rover, this big monstrous uh, thing that would seat about eight people. So they drove me into the village. First thing we met was the hospital administrator. Um, they'd been briefed that I'm coming in, they don't fully know what I'm supposed to be doing, so he was very nice. So he took me down to some housing. Uh, it's uh, block houses where employees of the hospital would live. Uh, not the doctors or the high ends, but you know, just the employees. And they introduced me to my roommates, uh, a Malay fellow, a Chinese fellow, and an Indian, uh, who uh, they would be my roommates. We shared this place, we had one bathroom, we had individual rooms, uh, and a bicycle. That's how we got the Peace Corps didn't want you to have a car to, you know, even all the, my peer workers had cars, I, I'm riding around on a bicycle. So they get over a little bit for them to figure out what, what's this person doing around on a bicycle? You know, it's not a status, it's a way to get around. So we so finally settle in, and I, I never really grew up as a kid eating rice. You know, that was not a standard, but that's every meal you have in Asia is rice. It may have vegetables with it, chicken, uh, something else, but so I had to quickly learn how to eat something that would give me sustenance. Uh, and then, uh, I go back in to meet the staff at the TB clinic where I'd be for two years. Uh, we had two wards of 50 men per ward and one ward of 50 women. They had advanced TB. They were there to get, uh, basically eat and get healthy. Uh, they followed them. They wanted to, uh, their lungs to see, and they were taking medication. Uh, and then we had a, people who walk into the clinic who would just come in to, for a checkup. And twice a week, a physician would sit down with x-rays examining everybody. I used to sit in with him. So I was just more trying to figure out what was going on, learning this, what the system was, and to see if there's something I could do to improve it. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we then, uh, what was the job itself? Well, a big part of the, the system that was in place was you go out to about 30 schools, you arrive at the school, elementary schools, and they had already been doing this with the older kids. So you go to the first grade, and every kid, 30 kids would get in line and they got a test, a man two test, they'd stick a needle in, 
Then they come back two days later. If there was a lump, it meant you, you had TB. So those kids were taken aside, letters to the parents saying, come in for further testing to find out who gave it to the kid. And who did they? So it was like COVID testing, follow-up testing of contacts. So that was, so once <coughs> we would used to follow, make sure the follow-ups were done, that the parents came in. And we worked with the village leaders in the village. They had like local doctors that the British respected. They were part of the regular health system. They'd call them up and can you get these people in? When they came back, if you didn't have a lump, you weren't, you got B, BCG vaccination. Everybody in Europe after the Second World War was vaccinated because this, all the cities were destroyed. The United States in a city, high risk areas, get, most people never had the BCG vaccination. They chose, told us when we went in, you're going to be dealing with TB patients. You know, do you want to get vaccinated? So some of us get vaccinated. Some of us waited to see if we had that man two test. If we get positive, then they gave us medications. So that was one part of the job that was already established. The second part was they would bring a van in that would go down by the local market and sit around to see if anybody wanted an x-ray. You know, and, you know people didn't, what, there was no communication. So they might do 20 x-rays in a day. So uh, that was something I thought I could jump on right away. So I went out and met with all of the, the government people, for teachers, engineers, police, fire, then arrange for the ambulances or the, the TB testing things to go to their site. So we get now 100 maybe tests per day. And then we finally agreed to bring it up to the hospital where the doctors, if they had a sketchy patient, would send them out to the van that was right there. So that was the basic method of the general population to find TB cases. I can remember growing up in Norwood, and there'd be a TB van there. You know, no one really knew what it was, but we did that in the United States also as a way to find. Uh, uh, I thought I heard that the United States Information Service had movies that they tried to share with local populations. So I call them up. So they would send me these big, massive reels over to, and I arranged with somebody that knew how to use them. It would have the TV patients out at night, out in a field watching movies. <laughs> Baseball in America, you know, uh, you know, various parks in America. Americans, it was all like, propaganda, but it was, there were no TVs there, so the men would go out one night, the women another night. One night we had the movie Jacqueline Kennedy visiting India, so they went nuts over that. You know, she's on an elephant, she's driving around. So anyway, that was entertainment for the locusts as best we could do. For the, uh, for my own relaxation, you would watch Hindustani movies with Malay subtitles. No TV, that's just the entertainment. So one night I'm in watching these things, <laughs> and they, uh, they have a, um, a newsreel in the middle of the movie. And the newsreel comes in, 1968, the Olympics in Switzerland, and there's a hockey game. And it just, it's just, they're not, no one's talking, but I see this big tall guy skating down the ice with the puck, and uh, I'm looking at it, and he was on the US Olympic team, who I played defense with at Brown in college. Bob Pedro, the first person in 10,000 miles that knew who this guy was. Couldn't believe it. Uh, the local people, the guy, people who were transferred to the East Coast, would, on weekends, rent boats. They'd take 10 people with a fishing boat out to these islands. And there were beautiful islands where you'd go out and swim. If you spent more than an hour in the sun, you'd be hospitalized. You're on the equator, it's, it damages your skin. But everybody had a mask and, and, and fins, and you'd, you'd swim around looking at the fish. Then you notice there's some guys there with these knives, and then whap a shell. And what happens, these beautiful, gorgeous shells would have a little th creature in it. And if you whack it, they pull themselves in, and if you don't, they can sting you just like a snake. So they'd whack them, put the thing in a, in a, in a bag that they would swim with, then they'd warn you about the snakes. You know, just if you see them, just stay away from them. But, I never knew sea snakes. In Malaysia, it was dangerous. Sea snakes would crawl up where it's about six inches of water and curl up. It's nice and warm. And every year, there'd be three or four people who would go running into the ocean, step on one, and you're dead in 30 seconds. So they, you had to be careful. But these fellows who picked up shells would bring them back home, bury them, and these people come over from England who, this is their, their specialty, shells. 
And these, they'd say, this, I've never seen this one before. They have phylum genus species of shells. So some of these guys, they would have phylums named after them. That's a whole new type of shell that no one has ever seen before. So fascinating to, to meet these uh, people in that. Uh, I studied Mandarin. I knew Malay, I could communicate, that Mandarin was a Chinese uh, uh, language that was being educated, everybody in the future, everybody had a local language, Hokkien, uh, Cantonese, whatever. So I'm in a classroom with a six-year-old boy at my table, there's 36-year-olds, and the teacher would go, wo man yo ker ha prem yo, and all, all of us would repeat that. And that's learning how to say, I like the horse in the, the window or something. Then you'd have a little book. It would have 60 little squares in it, and the teacher would do the strokes of a character. And it was, you had to do it this way if you ever did it this way. And then you'd hand those books out, and they would send them back to you with corrections. So I mean, I'm thinking this might be helpful someday. Until the first test came in, written in Chinese, I got a 67. The little boy had a 93. He looked at me as a little slow, you know. So. Then I realized no one spoke Mandarin. Everybody in the future, all my TV patients spoke Hokkien. So I hired a high school student who spoke both languages to teach me the Peace Corps method of speaking, you know, which he taught me. And then suddenly I saw where the, all the kids in Malaysia, who, the Peace Corps people who were teachers would on their holiday would go to this island of Penang that was all Chinese to study. So I would go over with them and I'd study intensively for about a week. So I got to be reasonably uh, productive. And many, many years later, uh, I'm studying in Europe for the summer, and I'm at a table talking to some young ladies from uh, uh, Holland. And these Chinese guys come to the table. Uh, and they're talking to each other. Can we buy you beers and all of this? And they're saying, how do we get rid of this guy in Hokkien? Now, some, I know everything they said. So at the end of the night, having had a very generous number of beers, I started talking Hokkien. They were shocked. You know, who the hell is this guy speaking uh, language? So the, uh, the head, the second person in charge of the, the TV program came to our town, and he met with all the officials, you know, checking on me, how's it going, all this. So he said, do you play golf? And I said, what I did many years ago in, in America. He said, well, would you like to play with me? I'm playing tomorrow at the Sultan's course. I said, well, I don't have any clubs. We'll get you clubs. So he gets me these used clubs. I stick them in the saddlebag of my motorcycle and I get out of the Sultan's estate, big walls around. There's two guys with machine guns in front. So I'm riding down, so I pull up, so they lower the machine guns at me like, I'm here to play golf. Every vehicle has been a Mercedes before me. So they finally let me in and I played golf once with these guys on the Sultan's private golf course, which wasn't too much, it was mostly just sand. The, uh, I did organize a reunion. I brought all my Peace Corps friends together to visit me. We had uh, five or six guys sleeping on my floor. The girls stayed in the nurses' quarters. I took them out to the island to see the, uh, the, the, the there. And then I got a bus one night to get out to this turtle beach. Uh, every year during August, these turtles, whose shells were about six feet long, would crawl up out of the ocean. The, their back feet would dig a hole and put their eggs into it, and they'd go off. And the government then would come in to protect the eggs, because previously, before they did that, people would steal them and eat them and sell them. And then they'd have these little pods of little tiny turtles go crawling back into the ocean. But it was an unbelievable thing to see. There aren't too many places where that thing is available. Uh, we had good relationships. One of my friends up in uh, 30 miles ahead of me, uh, the next, next uh, state up, had his motorcycle stolen. And uh, so he passed the word among all of his friends, some of whom I think were in the underground. So the word goes out. So they find the motorcycle up in Thailand someplace. They put it back together again, bring it back to him and said, sorry, we didn't know you were in peace school. So he gets it back. So that was a, a funny story uh, about the friendships we had among all parts. This is a story I'd just like to share with you because I've done the first draft of my memoir of what we've been through here. And people have suggested stories I might want to talk about the Peace Corps. And one, one that struck me, touched me, was the uh, ambassador, United States ambassador to Afghanistan, 
who had served in Afghanistan in the military. He then became the ambassador. And he was given this assignment to go out to an American-friendly village to pick up the body of an American soldier. So he flies out in the helicopter, and he gets out of the helicopter, well guarded, but it's an American-friendly village. So these people start coming up to him, the village leaders. They said to him, are, are you, you know, uh, first of all, we want to know if you're a member of, of Bill's uh, family, you know, uh, Bill's tribe. Because in Afghanistan, you're either the Taliban or the Pashtun, you're in a tribe. And so after five people say, hey, when Bill's tribe, he says to somebody, what, I want to find out what they're talking about. He says, well, Bill was a Peace Corps volunteer here 50 years ago. He was a teacher. He was on the village council. He helped us get water to the village, which now is our crops. And they, every time they see an American, mostly American soldiers, who they're friendly towards, they say, are you and Bill's tribe? So the ambassador, as he's flying back in the helicopter, he said, I wonder how many villages there are around the world who are American friendly because of a Bill that served them humbly doing the work. And he said, in our case, he, they've saved a lot of lives of the American soldiers, having somebody protecting them in American-friendly villages. I just felt that was a, an interesting observation made by a soldier. The, uh, what I did at the end of the first year, you do write home every week. That's it. There's no telephone or anything. You just write home. You get letters. That's how you communicate. Uh, took, you save every minute. We get paid $25 a month. And we had to pay food, housing, motorcycle, gas. And you save every minute so you could take a vacation and you got to fly. And so you could find cheap places to stay. But so I, I met one of my Peace Corps friends and we, we went up to Bangkok. Thought it was a fascinating city. Uh, spent some time uh, visiting uh, northern Thailand. Then we went over to uh, Hong Kong, which was still a British colony at the time. We took a, a boat over to a place called Macau, which was like the uh, Las Vegas of Asia. Uh, and uh, they had just driven the British ambassador out. So when we arrived with our American passports, uh, they were very, very friendly to the Chinese at that time, uh, communist Chinese, and they weren't quite the Chinese of today. They were, you know, read books and uh, uh, you, you weren't appreciating scholars. You know, you had to go work in the fields if you're educated. <laughs> Excuse me. So we did that. Then we f went over to uh, Manila uh, to visit uh, a Peace Corps friend who I went to elementary school with. He was a teacher and met uh, a girlfriend. His girlfriend became his wife and he came back, lived in the United States went to elementary school together. They went to Borneo, Sabah, Sarawak. Uh, half of Borneo is Malaysia, half of Borneo belongs to Indonesia. And that was the end of our first year's travel, uh, learning about well, the cultures a little bit. Uh, I'm going to get into year two. Uh, I met a, a Peace Corps volunteer while I was there. We eventually went down to dinner nights. It was a Chinese restaurant. With the motorcycle, I could get there in about 10 or 15 minutes. And the table would be people from all around Malaysia who were working in the East Coast, but they basically were from the West and were engineers and other things. So at the table one night was a kid, another Peace Corps volunteer from Minnesota who was working in agriculture. He was teaching them how to grow something called sorghum. It's like a corn meant for animals. It was much more powerful, much so. So we thought maybe we could become roommates and there were two Peace Corps girls in the area who lived in a village. They were teachers. And it was a fishing village. So we talked to them, and they are about to leave. So we said, do you mind if we try to take over the house? So we made arrangements. So we got a house that was on the beach in a fishing village for our second year. And Steve Pearson became my roommate. He put up with a lot because he knew all about farming and things, and I, I was clueless about that stuff. So we, uh, it was on a... The, the, the house was on the beach, and we had a beautiful porch that overlooked the South China Sea. We had a wire that gave us one light bulb and one refrigerator that was always full of beer. 
<laughs> there was some big difference. Uh, the, uh, some days I would take my motorcycle, go up over this hill, down onto the beach if it was low tide, and I'd go right down the beach to my hospital, which was down about two miles down the beach. That was a big thrill every once in a while I could do that. Uh, the, uh, the fishermen in the village we lived in, would they go out in their boats and they'd go out there five miles, ten miles. One of them would drop, they'd work in a team, one of them drop the, uh, the, the fishing gear, the other would take it around uh, and, and make a circle and they'd catch the fish in the middle and they'd pull it up. So at the end of the day, they came in to the village where I lived, and you'd see them out there, the boats would just come in. I got books over here you might want to look at, and uh, I don't know if you want to pass them out, Nancy, you could be looking at them while I'm talking, but in there are the, the boats. But the fishing boats would come in, and the way they got them up onto the beach, they'd put these big poles across the front and the back, and they'd lean into them and push them up over logs. These are pictures of uh, some of the things you could look at them and pass them around. The, uh, so we went out there, my, my friend and I would do it. We'd get in there with them, we'd, we'd push them up. So at the end of the pushing the boats, they'd give us a couple of fish, which we took in. <coughs> you take a look and pass them around. So this was a great place. And then we had three or four little kids, they're like about five or six years old, who would be over in our house all the time. They want to sweep, they want to clean the place up. They'd be there. We locked the house up during the day, but they'd be there waiting for us. So. And then we take photographs. They never had a picture ever taken, so we took photographs of them. They were thrilled that they were, for posterity. They had pictures of their kids and all. So we had great friends in this village. Then I had this idea of, there were chickens running around all of the time, just wild chickens. After you look at the book, pass them around, you can each share them, they're all different. So I said to my partner, why don't, why don't we get, uh, see a piece of give us a little money and put up some hen houses. So we have chickens in cages and we get eggs. And these people can use the eggs for nutrition or sell them to make money. So anyway, Peace Corps gave us some money. My, my farming friend was just, he didn't need more chicken. So we made, they came in one night and we made thir uh, uh, basically about 26 cages. You put the chickens side by side. They shared the water. We gave them feed. We had a local guy come in and bake a little hen house, which was chicken wire around it, uh, a, a typical Asian roof. We did have a door with a lock, uh, and we had uh, 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 26 uh, white leghorns. That was our, our, our chicken group. So I had great fun, just it was all like amusing to me. And we hired a foreman, one of the fishermen, who would go in every day. He marked off how many eggs were from each chicken, so we knew who, who we don't want to keep very long. Uh, and we sold the eggs to get some money uh, for more feed. The uh, I came up with ideas for new, new programs, new school programs. One was there were like three or four areas around us where that school program did not exist. So I came with, up with this idea to expand the school program. Would the National Center send me over four nurses, a, a driver, uh, a, a Land Rover, and all the BCG vaccination, the testing stuff for three weeks? And I would organize all the schools we go to that had never been tested before. So they, they approved this, I would organize all of and they would stay. Every town in Malaysia would have kind of like a, uh, a government-sponsored uh, motel. So government people have a place to stay when they're traveling. So we got the nurses set up on that, and I would organize every day. We'd go out to schools and do the testing, come back two days later, the BCG, and we had a local nurse who we would train how to carry the program on. So we did that, it was very successful. We ended up testing not just grade one, but grades one through six because these schools had never been tested before. So that was my original contribution with an idea that they spent a lot of money sending four nurses over like that for that period of time. Uh, we only had problem one day we couldn't go to a school uh, because of a man-eating tiger. There were tigers in the woods. And this, they were old tigers, but they get old, they can't, chase down the, the usual animals and uh, they, they knock out some poor lady walking down to do her wash in the river. So they couldn't let these kids go to school. The second program I developed was this idea of testing where the van comes in and tests people. And they were doing it around along the, uh, the, the, the villages that were pretty good sized, but there's one village way in the middle of the jungle uh, that they never did the testing. And they said, there's nobody in there that has TB. We don't want to do that. 
So I said, I'd like to do some testing just to see if it would be. So I said, well, we'll give you a van for three days. Okay, I say, fine. So what I did was, I, I wanted a way to explain TB to people. We got to schools and all. So I saw a movie about TB, and in it they showed people with lungs and coughing, in, like the cartoon format. So I took pictures of it. They made a slideshow, and they developed a way to explain to high school kids and all. So in this rural area, they arranged to have the head, every village had a like a leader. So we brought in like 10 leaders at this area, this 10 leaders, and I gave a presentation with a slideshow. The presentation was basically, there's a disease out here that kills people. It also debilitates, they can't work, they can't, the women can't, st but we know how to find it and we know how to cure it. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna come in here with a van and we're gonna test. You just stand up and we take a picture and if you've got it, we can basically give you the medication. Then I showed pictures of our, our TB wards where there are women and men in, 20 miles away where you come in and you eat good food, and here's the prayer room where you pray every day, five times a day as a Muslim. So that was, we did that for the men. We said, and we're gonna come out to a field, two fields at night to explain this to people. So we had a local uh, government has a van that goes out to these villages. They worked with us. So I go out at night with a slide. Uh, in the, you know, 300 people sitting in the field telling them about it's dangerous. You can give it to people, but we have a van coming in. So we get them all stirred up. <laughs> so the guys come in from Kuala Lumpur, really bored. They, there's no way they want to be there. So they bring it, they, they go over there with like about 100 films to take a, so at seven o'clock in the morning, they're out getting set up. They're, they're starting the, the, the van filming at nine and there's 300 people in the back of the lot. So they call in an emergency. Send us over by airplane, another 500. So anyway, that day they did about 500. Two more days, so they ended up doing 2,000. They would have done that in Kuala Lumpur in a month. And they came up with finding, what, 100 new TB cases and, you know, got all the people who gave it to them all tested out. So that was my second original program they gave me. So they said, how did you ever get people to do this? And I said, well, slides, explaining it. We had a cholera case in the village I lived in the year before. We didn't know how to explain it to people. We didn't know how to have them come forward. So maybe we can use this technique to get the public educated about coming forward when you can test people. Uh, the, uh, so that was, we had a going away party for Fred Jackson. He was a black Peace Corps volunteer. He was across the river from where we lived and we're giving, having a going party for him. We said, Fred, you just got here. Why are you going home after two months? I get drafted by my Mississippi draft board. So Fred goes over to Kuala Lumpur to prepare to go home. So the Peace Corps people were really upset. They can draft him when he comes home. The government's already spent a lot of money to train him to send him here. So uh, he gets over to Kuala Lumpur and Vice President Hubert Humphrey was there. And he said to Hubert, can you, so Hubert calls the draft board up and says, how can you be so reckless to the United States of America? We've spent all this money training this kid. You can draft him. So they said, let him stay. We'll, we'll get him later. The big porch that I told you about out in front of our house, it, uh, if you're a creative student graduating from college uh, in Ireland, England, all of Europe, and you were smart and you're entrepreneurial, you did the tour. After college, you would go travel through the Middle East, India, Bangkok, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, to Australia and New Zealand. And if you were the same creative entrepreneurial student in Australia, you did the same reverse. So what you would do is you'd find cheap places to stay, hostels. Sometimes you'd have five people in a room in bunk beds. Uh, or you stayed in a Buddhist temple. So it was, a, it was an inexpensive way to travel. So if you arrived in Bangkok, which was just north of where we lived, Bangkok is just above Malaysia, so here's Bangkok. Or in Singapore, if you arrived in those places, you stayed at a hostel. And you spent the night having tea or coffee or some beer with kids that had just come down through Malaysia. Or 
the reverse. You say, what did you see? And it was fascinating because you'd say, what did you see in India? You'd exchange ideas of what, what you saw, what was interesting. How did you go through Malaysia? You could go to the West Coast, which was trains, or the East Coast, which is rural fishing villages in the ocean. So they say, well, if you did the, you did the East Coast, where did you stay? This is, it's not a, there's no cities you can see. Well, halfway up to Steve Jolly, you know, we slept on their floor last night. So we'd get home from work. There'd be seven or eight people waiting to stay with us. They'd say, Bill in Singapore said hello, you know, Harry in Bangkok. So they'd come spend the night with us. So we spent many, many nights sitting out there with very smart, interesting people from Australia, New Zealand, and the European countries who were doing the tour. You know, which unfortunately, you know, if you're there, you know, in the United States, a lot of kids don't do the tour unless they take a year off or something. So it was a fascinating education just to meet them, talk to them, uh, learning what was of interest to them. One night we had a reporter of, from Le Monde, the French newspaper. He, he was traveling through, we heard about us, he comes out. Uh, we had a, a Yale anthropologist stay with us one night. We had Dr. Hugh Fulmer who, the first doctor hired by the UMass Medical School, the brand new school in Massachusetts, he was hired to set up a Department of Family Medicine. So we had fascinating people to sit down and, and talk with it. But we all would, would ask them, because I, I wanted to travel if I could home and later, what, what did you see in Indonesia? What did you see in, uh, uh, in, uh, in India? And so you, you got great ideas of what you might want to visit and see. Then they all got down usually to talk about Vietnam. You know, I had close friends serving in Vietnam. Uh, Nancy, my wife, lost 13 of her classmates in high school, died in Vietnam. It was a big issue of my age group going through. Uh, and every kid that went was there serving the country, was doing the best they can. And often when they came home, they were spat on or, you know, uh, and a lot of Vietnam veterans, they came home said, the guys I served with were courageous, loving, but the leadership who put us there was wrong. What the Europeans would say to you is, do you know this guy Ho Chi Minh who's in North Vietnam, who you're fighting? Do you know in the Second World War, he was your ally. He fought the Japanese. In the OSS, which was your first uh, part of your CIA, they worked with him. They had American flags and Vietnamese flags, and they fought the Japanese, and they kept Japanese soldiers from going to Guadalcanal and fighting you. How could you be fighting this poor guy? So the war ends and they say, did you realize when the war ended, all of these countries were given independence eventually. Malaysia got independent. Indonesia got independence from the Dutch. The Americans gave independence. The French came back who were helping the Germans in Europe and they were helping the Japanese. They said, we want our plantations back. We don't want to give these people. And the leader Ho Chi Minh, who spent two years at the Parker House in Boston as a young pastry chef, Traveled the world trying to get people to support independence for Vietnam. So I'm being educated by all these people. Do you realize there's no one in Vietnam with you other than the South Koreans and the Australians? All of your allies in World War II aren't there. We feel you're fighting the wrong guy. When the war ended, Douglas MacArthur, when found out we weren't giving Vietnam independence, said, I'm ashamed to be an American. That his, our ally, the supporter of us, and the French were helping the Japanese, we'd given them back their, their plantations. So it was a wonderful education about, and then finally, he beat the French, and, and, and he, he, he went to the, the Chinese and the Russians for help because no one would help him, so they called him a communist. But his Declaration of Independence against the French was our Declaration of Independence. He loved America, you know, as a, a power that got rid of an outside imperialistic power. So it was fascinating education, sitting on the porch, listening to all these people come through who are not, know a lot more about things than I did. Uh, the uh, visited Kuala Lumpur one time, and I went down to visit that man in Boston I mentioned to you, the governor of one of the states. Visited him twice. The first time I visited him, we went for lunch in his car with flags on it and motorcycle. He said, Charlie, you know who sat next to me in this car not too long ago? He said, President Johnson. I said, oh, good. Well, they went up and lowered this. The second time I visited him, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going up to one of the hospitals in your state. It's about 20 miles away. He said, I'm going there too. Can I give you a ride? Oh, fine. 
So I drive up with him. We arrive at the hospital, and there's 100 hospital employees out in front in their white uniforms standing in attention for the governor. So he says to me, would you accompany me? Reviewing the troops. So I'm walking with him down the row while he's waving to the troops. At the end of the troops is my Peace Corps friend who I'm visiting. So he's shaking his head. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, let's admit the doctor. So, so my, my friend became a little more famous for knowing somebody uh, in his hospital where he was just you know, a lowly Peace Corps guy down at the end of the table. The, uh, I then uh, went to visit one of my friends, Nancy Townsend. She was married to one of my friends. She was a physical therapist before she went into the Peace Corps. She said, Charlie, I've changed my job. I said, you're not working with TB anymore. She said, no, I'm working with le leprosy patients. Now, to me, I hadn't heard of leprosy. I heard of Father Damien, you know, in the Hawaiian, and I heard it in the Bible, but I didn't realize it was, uh, well, in Malaysia, if somebody has a leprosy, a kid, they take the whole family and they put them in this leprosy village. The fire, the police, the teacher, everybody in the village has somebody with leprosy to be treated. So she goes there to work. I think TB's high risk, but, so I went out with her one day to visit. And there's a thing, one of the things in leprosy, when you walk, your foot goes underneath as you walk. So they have this place where they put in a, a wire from your, fo from, your, from your foot to your knee. So every time you lift it up, it lifts your foot up. So she, one of her physical therapy things was training people how to walk and all of this. But I, I arrive at this leprosarium and these people are hugging her, people with leprosy and I'm going, gee, this is unbelievable, you know, but she, uh, was a very courageous lady doing that work. Uh, finally, I, uh, I was at, a, uh, at the TB, TB Center doing a debriefing of those two programs I told you that I set up. And I went in to the restroom to take a break and I, I fainted, I never fainted in my life. So they bring me in to this big conference room and they lay me out on the table. And doctors have a way of sticking their fingers into your stomach to see if you have an enlarged liver. They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. They put me in an ambulance to take me out to a hospital. It was an unusual hospital in Malaysia. It was a Catholic hospital with Chinese nurses. And I spent two weeks in the hospital on an IV because I couldn't swallow anything and keep it down. And I'd go from uh, feverish types of things where you would lie in bed. I'm in a room with three other guys. They'd pack ice on you because your body is so feverish. And then you'd come out of that. They'd strip all the clothes and everything off of you because you started shaking, and the bed would just, and it was amusing for about an hour, and then it just started to get weaker and weaker and weaker, you know. And they didn't, first they thought I had infectious hepatitis, then they thought I had malaria, then dengue fever. I used to take chloroquine, which was a medication to prevent malaria. None of that worked, so after about three, two and a half weeks, and I lost 30 pounds, they said we we're gonna, ship you over to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines where all of the American diseases, uh, State Department, military, so they're getting me ready, they're gonna try a cocktail, all of Medicaid's, the cocktail worked, everything ended, and after I get my, you know, wasn't you're dizzy, lying in bed all the time, I finally get back into action, but you suddenly uh, realize that, uh, you know, you're lucky, very lucky and very close to you know, the 300 people I mentioned who died in the Peace Corps, a lot of them died of illnesses as well as accidents. Uh, they later felt I had dengue fever. And, and the, what happens is somebody, everybody where I lived had malaria at one time in their life. They, and they just survived. They, they're not, they're weak. They don't, they're not in the field. It slows you down, but you don't necessarily die. Uh, but uh, the mosquitoes biting them are biting me. Everybody sleeps in a mosquito tent. You know, it's a, it's a, it comes down from the ceiling, covers your bed, so you, uh, you're in there. It protects you from snakes and from mosquitoes. <laughs> I had a snake in my house, so I was always worried, waking up, looking at things. But the, uh, uh, I get bit at some other time by a mosquito that had just bitten somebody, so I get infected by... Yeah. Now, what happens is once they get into you, they have babies, you know, and the reason you get these fevers is your body's reacting to this new, you know, the new 
explosion of young, your, your, your white blood cells. So the heat that you're exploding with is your body trying to fight off this strange thing that you have. But it was, uh, they, they felt, and then I took medications for a year after that, just because, of, but it was some form of dengue fever is the last thing they felt, felt it was. Uh, the almost half the people in Malaysia are Muslims. The next country over, uh, um, uh, which is Indonesia, is the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, and most of Southeast Asia was Buddhist. Uh, Buddhism is a form of Hinduism. Hinduism, within Hinduism, has it castes. You're born a Brahmin. You're, a, you're born a untouchable. You can only have a certain job. And Buddha was a young Hindu prince that didn't like that. He just felt that was wrong. He loved Hinduism. So I'll later talk about how he visited the place where Sanath in India, where Buddha sat under a lotus tree and got inspired and developed Buddhism, which became very popular in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, parts of China, Zen Buddhism in, in Japan. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, Muslims started coming over to Southeast Asia to get the spices. They suddenly realized that spices, pepper, and things like that were worth more than gold in the Mediterranean, selling around these countries. So they knew where it was. They came into Indonesia, Malaysia, and as they came in, they changed the religions. So right down the whole strip of Indonesia, it became, except for Bali, which I'll talk about later, Bali stayed. So anyway, it was, uh, just came in and Thailand, Indonesia, I'm sorry, Thailand, uh, Laos, and uh, Vietnam all remained uh, uh, Buddhist. But uh, so anyway, we, uh, uh, I, I just found Islam to be very interesting and what a lot of people, did. my best friends were Muslims. It hurt me when I heard that Muslims were being told they can't come to the United States. <coughs> Certain Muslim countries were, were, were banned not too long ago from the United States. Uh, and yes, there were Muslims who were terrorists, just as there were Jewish people and Catholics who were terrorists. You know, it's not, but everyone I ever knew were, were warm, loving people. That, uh, and what people don't fully realize is that uh, in Islam, they have the same Old Testament that we have. Uh, and their, their current uh, direction in religion is based on prophets. One of their prophets is Muhammad. The other prophet is Jesus Christ, and the only woman mentioned in the Muslim Quran is Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, I mean, they're not that different from their what's good, what's a good person, what's a good life. So I learned a lot of respect uh, for that. While I was in Malaysia, we, we didn't have newspapers, were, TV, nothing. We did hear about Martin Luther King being killed. And it was hard to take when you're not with friends, understanding how did that ever happen. Uh, and two months later, Robert Kennedy was killed. I happened to be on the West Coast with friends of mine uh, who were Indians. And I was, I was taking a walk, and they came out and said, Charlie, we, something happened. You've got to come back. They had a television set in the Western part, and uh, it was a very hard thing to fully listen to and appreciate. Uh, second year, we take a vacation. We decided to go to Indonesia, a very interesting country. Uh, we learned a lot from the people traveling through about what it stayed. So we stopped on the island of Java and rode, took a train. This is the island of Java going right down here. Halfway down the island of Java, in one of the books I have here, uh, is a place called Borbadur. It's, it's become a tourist place now, but at one time it was a, a big center for, for Buddhism. And they built these big, big bells, about 12, 20 feet high, with a 10-foot Buddha sitting inside of it. And they went up, it's a mountain of like 200 of these bells. When they heard that the Muslims were coming in, they buried it. It was just under a hill. So when the Dutch came in as colonial powers, they said, you know, underneath that hill. So they got in, anthropo they dug it out and it just became a, a wonder of the Asian world. Uh, and we had to go, it just you walk up and down, you just can't believe it, and I took a lot of pictures. At the end of the island, uh, uh, is um, Surabaya, and they have, you know, in those days we would travel if we could by boats and things. So we go out on an LST, the boats would come in and land the troops. So we went over to Bali. Bali remained 
a Buddhist Hindu state. What was unique about it is every village in Bali, during the day you went out and you worked in the fields, you planted rice. You'd be driving down on a truck walking by, the women are out there bare-breasted. This was a very different world. At night, every village was devoted to the arts as a part of Hinduism. Some villages sang songs, some did dancing, some did plays, some did wood carving, some did beautiful paintings. It's, it's amazing, that, but that's the culture. That, so there was a hotel on the island, at that, there's many of them now, it's a big tourist place. Uh, and they made deals with some of these villages who were gonna bring a busload of people out for uh, a performance. It's a, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a story out of the, uh, the, the, the Hindu uh, literature. So we'd find out about them, we'd hitchhike out to take in the show and all. So we got to have a wonderful experience and I, uh, because of my wife's creativity, I, I learned from the people who visited us that when you go to Bali, they don't want money, they want acrylics to do painting with in dungarees. So I, I bought them, I'm, I'm there bargaining. So I bought a beautiful painting that I have today of uh, uh, painted in Bali. But it was, it's a, just a unique place to visit and we spent, fortunately, a week there. Uh, we're back in Malaysia and it's getting close to be uh, uh, time to leave. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting in a, a bar one day and I hear this song on the, the jukebox going back to Massachusetts. So, a Bee Gees song, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Bee Gees. It was brand new to them, but I'm saying, am I hallucinating, you know? Anyway, that was, so I was getting ready hearing that. Uh, the, uh, they, they bring you in for a debriefing. What did you learn? What do you have to offer and all of that stuff? I took an exam on my uh, Malaysian proficiency. The State Department has people come in and they, they give me an FSI 3 which means I was at a, a good high level of reading and writing Malay. Uh, the, while I was in, about to leave the second death in Malaysia when I was there, my kid went to get drowned uh, right in front of where I lived. Uh, but then I did, they give you a, a plane ticket that's a plane ticket home. You can go home in two days. And this was like late, uh, uh, it was late November. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna be here probably for a long time why don't I see what I can see on the way home? So you take the ticket and you go to a travel agent and say, I want to go from Singapore to uh, Phnom Penh and in Cambodia. Then I want to go to Bangkok. Then I want to go to Kathmandu. Then I... So you work your... So I decided to go with Angkor Wat, which is a part of Cambodia. It was uh, an incredible series of 90 temples uh, built around 1200 AD that the Thais came in and fought the Khmers, which the people in Cambodia beat them. They went down into southern Cambodia, and this, this complex just ended up being overrun with trees. So when the French came in as a colonial party, out there in the jungle. So suddenly they went out and started to carve it out. Remember Jacqueline Kennedy went there to visit. So I said, this is unbelievable. So I fortunately had, took my wife back there two years ago, but I was there you know, probably over 55 years ago to visit this incredible complex. So instead of, the, you know, uh, you know, wonders of the, the Asian world to see this place. So I started there, went to Bangkok again to see some friends, went to Kathmandu in, in Nepal. What I didn't know about it was uh, Kathmandu has Mount Everest, which is like 35,000 feet or something like that. There's also 10 other mountains, all about 35, you know, they just, they won out by 20 feet. So when you're coming in an airplane, the, pl the plane flies at 30,000 feet. So to get, make sure you get over the last mountain before you dive, and it doesn't come in great, you gotta go in like this. So you can't get up to the state, you know, wham, you land. Uh, it was a very interesting place to visit. Uh, it was very, very isolated. Uh, there were Peace Corps volunteers who served there, actually. Uh, they would tell about where they live by how many days walk it is, you know, over the mountain around, and Peace Corps people died there falling off the trail, you know, went down 10,000 feet, uh, they misstepped on the trail. Uh, but then I went over to India, based on advice, uh, to a city called Banaris. It's the most sacred city in Hinduism. Uh, you walk through the city and all you hear is chanting going on. These are little chapels where people are praying and you get out of the river, they have these steps going down in all these places and as you walk down the steps, there's uh, uh, cows wandering around, cows are sacred, they just wander around and eat things that they get and people are sitting there 
but you get down into the river, and I have some paint, uh, pictures here of just you know people down at the river praying, and uh, in along the river you have piles of uh, uh, timber, you know, with different prices for cremations. You know, you pay top dollars, or you, can, you know that's where you take your loved ones if you can get that far to get there to the sacred city to cremate the bodies and the ashes thrown into the river. I went to the next village over, which was Sanath, where Buddha sat under the lotus tree to bring Buddhism to the world, two major religions. Then I had the opportunity to go over and see the Taj Mahal and its history and go into the building and walk around uh, in Agra. So it was just fascinating to visit some of the places that were advised. And then on the way home, it was just a matter of, uh, you know, you know, I'd love someday to go back, but I'd love to see Athens and Rome and Paris and, and London. So I had short stops in each of those. When I got to London, I met another Peace Corps volunteer who was in the British version of the Peace Corps, so we had a little reunion and you know, came back uh, uh, at that time and got home for Christmas uh, with my family. Uh, I originally wanted to go into international health. I thought that would be fascinating to work with the World Health Organization. And, and then I went to Cornell to, for graduate school and after about a year I realized that the, the most backward country in the world for the money they spent in healthcare was the United States. We ranked 21st in the world in infant mortality. Uh, I mean, it was, and I, I said, well, that, that's what I want to spend my career in, you know, the United States, uh, and seeing what I can do to make a difference and reform uh, in the United States. So anyway, I'd be happy to answer questions you may have now. If you want to follow up at some other time, I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, but please feel free to. Well, you saved, you know, uh, you, you saved a lot. You ate cheaply. Uh, the, the rent we paid was cheap, but you basically saved up everything you could. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the the trip home, the, all the trip home I mentioned, the Peace Corps gave you the money. For they gave you a, a plane ticket from you know, twelve thousand miles, and you had to figure out not to go over twelve thousand. But you know, they paid for you to get there. They paid for you to come home. But the first trip I took, which was up to Hong Kong, to Indonesia, and the trip to once we flew over to uh, Indonesia, we just you know traveled down on a train. So. Did the planes cost significant money? No, you know, you, you flew local airlines, and uh, any long trip we had paid for, which was coming home and going there. But it you did watch what you spent and. You know how much you spend on beer and things like that, but uh, but a lot of uh, the travel you just you know they had a system in Malaysia if you wanted to go from Kuala Terengganu uh, to Kuala Lumpur you didn't fly you know you'd take taxi cabs and the taxi cabs you'd go into a town you went to the taxi cab stand and you wait around you had four people to go to the next place that's how how you went to travel cheaply you know but you, you figured out how to do it and uh, it would have been, you know, we, we did, you know, a few flights, but other than that, it, uh, it was not that bad. Yes? Okay, Charlie, we have a war going on in Vietnam at this time that you are there in yeah. Malaysia. Did you feel, my basic question, did you feel safe during your Well, we were, we were safe in the sense that the, uh, the we did have, when you're in, in Vietnam, you had a month rest and recreation after six months. And they would come to Malaysia, they go to Thailand, they go to Kuala Lumpur. So we, we ran into veterans. Uh, I had one friend in Vietnam who wanted to visit me. Uh, and at the last minute he said, they're not gonna let me leave the group. They don't want us to be scattered. We have to stay together. So, uh, but as far as safety, uh, when I traveled to Angkor Wat, which was to fly into Phnom Penh, which was about 30 miles from uh, from uh, Saigon, and already there were North Vietnamese. You know, th at that time I felt, you know, uh, when we went to visit uh, 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 the, the part of China, when we went on a Hong Kong visit, you know, that it was the Portuguese theoretically were in charge of the city, but the Chinese ran it. And when they saw our American passports, we were a little concerned that you know you could disappear or something might happen there, but. I, I didn't personally feel it, uh, uh, threatened by the Vietnam War, war where I was, uh, and uh, and you know had a chance to meet a lot of the veterans that were there, and many of my best friends were 
serving in Vietnam at the time, and uh, they they were upset about having what what they did. You know, as far as they felt they they're, they're trying to make some colonels generals. You know, as far as when they were uh, took a hill and then were withdrawn from the hill after losing two or three thousand soldiers. You know, they they were very upset with some of that uh, treatment, but. I don't know if that answers your question, but we we didn't feel threatened. When you were in Malaysia, away from Vietnam, did you feel safe in Malaysia with your tuberculosis clinic and doing the peaceful work? Did you feel safe during that? Yeah, you know, I think the the people that I worked with in the hospital became good friends. You know, I was invited to their birthday parties. To them. So I mean, I was a part of the neighborhood. I was a part of the group, and they they never fully could understand what we were doing there. You know. I remember when I was at the TB Center where they had elevators and all of this, and and there was a guy, I got on the elevator, there was a guy on the elevator, and we, were, we used to talk back and forth. And so after about the third time we talked, he said, would you like to join me tonight? I'm going out to the University of uh, Malaya to meet my girlfriend, and you know, just meet some people, so I went out with him. I found out he was, his name was Manny Jagathesan. He was the, the uh, uh, fastest man in Asia. He was in the Olympics representing Malaysia, but he's faster than any other person, and he became a physician. So I spent a night out at, at, with his girlfriend, at, you know, and they just couldn't stop to ask questions. <laughs> what are you doing here? Where did you go to school? Here I was at Brown, they, they knew Brown. They said, oh, you know, you're not you know, being sent out over here to get, America's not sending you because you're a criminal. You know? So it was a very different co concept why people gave up two years to be there, and particularly in a place that wasn't too popular, the East Coast, you know, which, that's no TV, no newspapers, you know, you had to suck it in and get by with things you were used to, uh, but uh, that was the only thing I felt, you know, people, and they didn't dislike you. I never felt any dislike, and matter of fact, the, about the guy whose motorcycle was stolen, we're, we're welcomed by all levels of society, you know. Just because we were there, and uh, we we kept, you know, we didn't get into politics. Uh, we didn't get into, and and also some of the Peace Corps people, that, you know, we lost one person. I think uh, had to be taken home because we I mean, had like a nervous breakdown, you know. And when you're there and no one sees you every day, they don't know if you're normal or not normal. So they they really try to look out to see other issues that you may have, you know. So. I'm sorry, yes, Steve. Yeah, you had um, a lot of good friends there that you developed. How did you disengage after two years? How did you bring that? All of a sudden, they, they didn't get around. Well, you know, we, we kept in touch with some of them. Uh, some of the, uh, a couple of the girls uh, that were with married Malaysian guys, uh, there was, uh, you know, but to be honest with you, I didn't keep as close a touch as probably I should have. I. When I went to Cornell as a graduate school because they had a Southeast Asian Studies program, Yale and Cornell the two. So I studied, initially I was gonna go into national health. I, I continued studying the May language. I met a lot of people there. Uh, I, I wrote, I gave them some of my early memoirs of just special projects I did for the Cornell Library, which they used. But you know, as I look back at it, I wished I had probably followed up with uh, one of my close friends, uh, 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 almost married one of the Malaysian girls in our group, and she decided no, and she updates me on that friendship and relationship for a long time. But I, I do regret not having probably kept in touch, but I didn't have somebody that was like my best friend that I dealt with every single day. I just had a lot of people. Uh, one of our Peace Corps volunteers went back uh, about 15 years later and met with the director of the TV program, and he said, you know, we did it. You know, we could Malaysia of TB, not not our group, you know, for our two years, but he felt we made a difference, but we helped move it along, and it was no longer the number one disease, because they had a lot of it under control with ideas and things that we suggested. So, there, you know, there's feedback like that that was nice. There was one girl in our group who worked in a, a Chinese city of Penang, and she'd walk to her TB clinic through a pediatric ward, uh, and there'd be these four little boys huddled over in the corner. One had TB, one had scoliosis. They had chronic diseases that they were hospitalized. And so she would go over after a while and 
talk to them. They couldn't believe that there's this white European woman talking to them in their language. So she became good friends. So then she started singing songs to them, you know, some of the sound of music and songs like that. And they all would sing with her. So then she saw where the movie, The Sound of Music, was coming to town. So she arranged with the hospital to take these four kids in an ambulance to see the show. So she said they sat there singing all the songs. Unbelievable. She went back, I don't know, 15, 20 years later. She kept in touch with these kids. Some of them died. But she arranged to meet one of the kids that she had. So she meets the kid with his kid singing Sound of Music. So she was very touched for that little kid who was chronically ill for God that she had made a difference. So there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, Otis Montgomery, the black person who served in three wars, uh, he told me one story where the van was coming to his city. He was in the middle of nowhere. In the, in the, and his job was to get people to come to the van. So he'd walk around the village. There's a van coming. It would be good to get x-ray. And he looked in the back room, and this little girl peeking her head out around a corner. So he said, come on out. What's the matter? So she comes out, and she has a, a deformed back. So he tells her about this and how you should come in and get this x-ray. So the day the van is there across the town, town square, the little girl's coming with a box as a crutch to get across the thing with her back. These guys running the van say, we can't do her. She, we can't get her up against the... He says, you're going to... He carries her up. He puts her up against the thing. They do an x-ray. He takes her down. She's thanking him so much that they, she has shown so much disrespect by everybody. So later, he checks out the results, and she has no problem. So he goes to her home to give her the good news. So he tells her, it's great, you don't have the disease. So she, she gives him a hug in tears. That, you know, the respect that this, he's an American, but looks a little different. Had the, the decency to come to tell her that she was good. She didn't have many people say that to her. So there's wonderful stories you hear where somebody made a difference, went out of their way, maintained a friendship, and so anyway, Otis Montgomery, Passed away in 95, about a year or two ago. But we had him in Westwood about four years ago. He came here for a reunion, so it was fun to, to, to get him and a lot of people together. If anything comes up later, questions you might have, I'd be happy to. Yes, we, uh, I'm planning a reunion in Maine for people who come together with us. We're planning it. We had one in Westwood. We brought everybody in. We got a tent. We went to a Red Sox game. We went to the Kennedy Library. We uh, we uh, went to the Pops. So we, you know, uh, I've been to Texas, to Lake Tahoe. I was up at uh, parts of Maine. So we, we tried about every five years. Uh, out of the 40, we might have 15 and their, their wives and husbands get together. But it was, a, it was a close group that we remember. And I think a lot of the groups do get together. You know, just they remember the time together. And they, so I'd say a large number of Peace Corps groups do get together. And a lot of them do continue working with the Peace Corps, advising people or finding positions, jobs, and all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot, there's a lot of activity that goes on, you know, as far as uh, when people get out, depending on how much energy they have. and. So it's uh, it's become a you know I think I think people are very proud of it and uh, we've uh, nothing but you know fond memories and it did change a lot of our lives as far as uh, how pushy we were or how ballsy we were and things we tried to do. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time and I just also want to thank the Westwood Media Center. And Connor Lynch, who was very patient tonight, uh, putting this together. Thank you, Connor.